I share some of your concern, but I think there's also a, a little bit of a dose of reality. Last year in, Jamie, I don't know if you remember this off the top of your head or stolen base percentage, but it was significantly high. I mean, as, as a team, it was it was one of those numbers that kind of jumped off the page. And, you know, in, in a time horizon, you just don't simply steal bases at that success rate over a course of a season and then do it the next year. I mean, it, so I think we understood there was going to be some regression. I think you guys who watched us play, I'm sure you guys do as much as, as, you, as you possibly can. We stole third base a ton last year, and typically in a format of a double steal. So you were going, you, in a lot of those instances, you were getting two stolen bases with zero caught stealing. The league, you know, the game is all about adaptations, and the league adapted to us. They recognized that we were doing this on a regular basis. That's almost a play that you haven't seen us do this year. You know, and that was the lion's share of a lot of our steals were those those types of those types of scenarios. To be fair to Julio, unfortunately, you know, when when his on base percentage regressed from close to forty percent to thirty percent, his opportunities to steal have, have dis, you know, diminished significantly. Our team, you know, a, a silver lining of this is our team's success rate of going from first to third on singles has been has improved, uh, and not by a small margin. And we're one of the better teams in the game on that. We're one of the better teams of going from second to home on a single. We're one of the better teams of going from first to home on a double. So while our stolen bases have regressed, uh, and significantly so, in some other key areas which really lead to producing and scoring runs similar to a stolen base, we actually have improved. Some of those were subtle improvements, but improvements nonetheless. So I think we feel going into, uh, no, I don't know if anyone knows that Vladimir occasionally gets thrown out. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm watching the game, I think that, but I'm not sure if that's just me. Yes. Sometimes he hits into a double play as well. Um, so I, I do think there's some circumstantial changes this year, but I also think there was some degree of regression to the norm. But the silver lining does still exist that there have been areas where we've shown some improvement. I know you've got a question, but right quick, you know, one of the things that comes up on the show all the time is. Okay, the Rangers are a very aggressive base running team in that regard. You just showed the stats to back that up. But sometimes that leads to, well, this is a mental area. Should have never gone for it in this situation. Do you think we would see any change going into the postseason, or is it going to be the same style that we've seen? I, I think there's two sides to that coin. And I think as a function of how much we play Anaheim, you guys see that every year. There are no repercussions in Anaheim for getting thrown out on the bases. They subscribe to a theory of always push the envelope when the ball's in the dirt, when the catcher you know, doesn't block a ball, take the base. When there's a chance to go from first to third, there's no opportunity that's a bad opportunity. And they, and they accept the fact that they're going to be safe 75% of the time, You know that they're going to push the envelope, they're going to make it tough on the other team, and that the net effect is they're going to get thrown out 25% of the time, and they're going to benefit from it 75% of the time. But I think the reason they're successful, and why it's 75% and not 50%, is because there is zero thought in their mind of, oh boy, what happens if I get thrown out? Oh, oh goodness, well, there's no hesitation. And so I think the one side of the coin is none of us feels good when we get thrown out. We all do feel good when the guy advances an extra base, but quite frankly, you probably feel worse when we get thrown out than you feel good when we advance. But I think if you create that sense of doubt in the players' minds that there is a repercussion for getting thrown out, I think you'll see the success rate diminish significantly. And I think that's that's something that Wash is very sensitive to. So we have had kind of global discussions about how we need to be smarter on the base pass, but we've never gotten to the point where we told them categorically, stop running or think about what you're doing before you try to advance that extra base. Because I think our concern is what you think you hesitate, once you hesitate, your chances of uh, advancing or, or diminish your chances of getting thrown out or increase significantly. Guys, that just passed me a note that said there's a lot of baseball to watch and a lot of Jaeger Meister to drink. So just <laughs> two more questions if we could, this gentleman, and then one more. If somebody's got a really good one, we want to go off on a, on a really strong note. You know, when is, when's the next move, to, one move too many? I. Uh, I think that's something we'll constantly evaluate. You know, we'll, we'll look when we when we look at this season in retrospect. We'll definitely be evaluating that very exact point uh, because we don't take that lightly. You know, I think in each of those players' moves, uh, there was a need at the time. Uh, it wasn't just a superfluous add. You know, in Cantu's case, we we felt we needed a right-handed complement to whomever was going to be playing first base for us, whether it was Chris Davis or Mitch Moreland. Uh, in Guzman's case. With uh, Kinsler going down, 
I, unfortunately, with a track record of not healing too quickly, we did have some concerns about how uh, you know naked we'd be with him. We also were looking at trying to improve our utility position for for the postseason. I think you referenced that you couldn't even remember the other crap birds that we got. Um, <laughs> allow me to illuminate some of them. Uh, Molina hasn't played as well as we had hoped, but at the time of the acquisition, it was really a need based upon some injuries we had, uh, and so we didn't. I, I guess the point is, other than Cliff Lee, we didn't really envision that any one of these guys was going to put us over the top. They all were going to be complementary pieces. I think we felt, yeah, we could probably win with them. Uh, but once again, the metric that we're using to try to succeed this year is not just to get to the playoffs, but hopefully advance once we get there. And so as much as we felt that we probably had a 25-man roster that, as constituted, could, could win the West, with all due respect, like we, we're not going to play the Oakland Athletics in the, in the playoffs. We're going to play three teams that are very, very good, and that we, quite frankly, had a little tough time beating this year. And if, you know, when CC Sabathia started, we had the latitude to play Cantu instead of Moreland, I think we at least wanted to be able to make that call. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the best 25 players are going to make our playoff roster. That decision has not been made. And unfortunately, as we sit here today, those guys really have not performed well at all. Uh, and so it makes that question, you know, probably have a little bit more bite than it, we wished it would. Uh, you know, we wish nothing more than these guys would succeed and prove to be nice complimentary pieces, but as it currently stands, that has not been the case. And with regards to the Pudge situation, you know, when the season ended uh, and Pudge was with us last year, uh, you know, I think we sat down with all of our scouts, we evaluated the, the catchers who were out there. You know, it came down to that very, very quickly in the offseason, Washington expressed sincere interest in him to the tune of offering him a two-year deal. And I think from our perspective, while we did have some interest in Pudge, it really wasn't to best a two-year deal. And for where he is in his career, uh, he really wasn't in a position where he wanted to accept a one-year deal instead of a two-year deal. So once it became a two-year discussion, it really was relatively easy for us to, to part ways and recognize that he was going to a better opportunity and that we were going to have to seek help elsewhere. Uh, clearly, we had higher expectations for Saltalamaki and Tea Garden than what it proved to be. We're going to need this gentleman to come back up and ask another question. <laughs> And this one with a little more teeth in it, if you would. <laughs> we need to step it up. But uh, so to answer your question, I, I think we share a similar sentiment to the, everyone in this room about, about uh, Pudge and the importance he had to this organization. And quite frankly, what he still has left in the tank. Uh, we've been very conscious of signing multi-year deals to players that we feel are either plateauing or kind of on the downside of their career. You know, we've, we've signed the one-year deals with guys like Marlon Bird and Milton Bradley and Vladimir Guerrero and Darren Oliver, you know, with the hope that we'd never get burned and, and uh, shouldered with a deal that, that just doesn't fit for us. And so that was kind of what went into that decision. Once he had a two-year offer, it kind of became a, a mood issue. So, so we have uh, effectively three different types of scouts, short, heavy set, and then there's some taller ones. Uh, no, I'm kidding. No, we have amateur scouts. So the amateur scouts scout all of the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico, because all of those uh, amateur players, high school and college and junior college, are eligible for the draft every year. And we have, I think, 16? Yeah. I'm going to say with conviction, 16 of those. Some of them have as small of an area as Southern California. Some of those have as large of an area as the Great Northwest. You know, and that's multiple states that they'll cover. So those guys are our amateur scouts. We have professional scouts who uh, scout the entire minor league system and major league systems of every single team. And then we have international scouts, which are, we currently have scouts in the Dominican, Venezuela, Mexico, the Pacific Rim. We have two guys who are permanently placed in Japan, but they cover the entire Pacific Rim. And we are now working into other parts of South America and Central America. How many is that? Uh, we have, I think, a total of 25 scouts. That's it? Yeah, 25 full-time scouts, and then probably another six to eight part-time scouts.